Welcome to the Trading Bell. I'm Nogib Kimboya. And today, another good news. A new entrant to the Ibuka program. And this new entrant is not new to the game. Quite experienced, has been there, seen that. And based on that experience, they are able to project where uh, the future is heading. And with that said, them coming into a booker program and hopefully to be listed uh, soonest. Uh, it will be quite an honor for them and also for the market because issues marketing deepening is quite a discussion that we've had on this show and many other platforms out there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today I'm honored to be joined by the one and only Dr. Kanyenje Gakombe, who is the founder and executive director of Metropolitan Health Services Limited. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. This is not your first interaction with the stock exchange. Actually, it goes back in the early years, even before the formation of this company. In 1991, you interned at the stock exchange. That's correct. I was a medical student who was interested in investment because uh, I knew one of the directors of the stock exchange, one of the stock owners of a stock broking firm. And uh, I asked him to offer me a holiday job. And he offered me a job at the Nairobi Stock Exchange. So I was among the first three employees wow. of the exchange. So I worked for the exchange for three months, then worked for a stock broking firm for one year because uh, the University of Nairobi went on strike and we needed to find stuff to do. So I worked as a stockbroker, I was trained as a dealer. I actually have a certificate uh, the, among the first certificates of trainees for dealers on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. Wow, and that laid the foundation in terms of understanding the market and what it offers? Yes, it did, because on a day-to-day -day basis, I was fortunate that my, my employer, in a sense made me his PA and taught me everything uh, he knew. Uh, Lauren Sutcliffe for Francis Drummond uh, Stockbrokers. So I got to meet clients, I got to trade uh, in the way trading happened then as a dealer. I got to review balance sheets of companies and write reports and make presentations. So in a year's time I knew quite a bit. And it's actually in one of those interactions that I met uh, the person who became uh, Metropolitan's angel investor, uh, Mr. Ankram Evans, who was a British citizen who had invested his army pension in Kenya and was then a director of uh, City Trust. Or it used to be called City Brewery. It's a company that became City Trust. And uh, so when he, because he was our client and uh, his father was a doctor, he was very interested in what I was doing. And he funded, he provided a lot of the funding that we used to set up Metropolitan Health Services. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So a lot of what you've done has something to do with those days in the stock exchange. Yeah, definitely. And that is quite a rich foundation because you are coming from a professional background of being a doctor and also you're inculcating this business angle of it. And that brings us to Metropolitan Health uh, Services in its initial days. Uh, what is the mot motivation of coming uh, into, into this sector? Um, the biggest was that in the early 90s, Kenya was going through uh, what were known as the structural adjustment programs. The economy was in a very bad place. Medicines were not available uh, to patients. The, the, the healthcare system was overwhelmed. And as I was then a medical student, and as we are training, we were acutely aware that we were going to work in a very, very difficult environment if we stayed in the public service. And we began to ask the question, what shall we do with our skills? And we thought the best thing was to take control of our destiny, leave the public service, and uh, set up a healthcare facility where we could uh, offer an alternative uh, healthcare provider that was more affordable, uh, but at the same time providing a good quality of service. If you look at where Kenyatta National Hospital is, it overlooks Nairobi Hospital. Mm -hmm. So at that time, the, those who had the financial resources would be able to access Nairobi Hospital. Mm -hmm. Those who didn't were two to a bed in Kenyatta. 
And uh, despite the valiant efforts that uh, the people in Kenyatta are making, it's difficult to give quality health care when you have, the system is overloaded. It doesn't matter who you are. As long as the system is overloaded, quality gets compromised. Mm -hmm. So w the vision we had was to set up a hospital that in a sense would sit on Gong Road. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, quality as close to Nairobi hospitals as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, price as close to Kenyatta as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's where Metropolitan has tried to sit all these years. Okay. Provide quality health care uh, and try to innovate and keep it affordable mm -hmm. to the middle class. Clearly, there is a population that private health care can't look after, which is a population that cannot afford to pay at all because private health care depends on patient fees to pay staff to buy medicines to equip and everything else mm -hmm. um, so you need people who can afford to pay but there are also people who strain a lot to access uh, the leading healthcare facilities uh, or the older ones because their prices are significantly higher so we were targeting to provide to the middle class mm -hmm. and our going to Buruburu was very very deliberate because a lot of the middle class and the lower middle class live to the east of the city. Mm -hmm. We were also trying to address a historical problem. Mm -hmm. The east, which is where Nairobi was expanding to, had no healthcare facilities mm -hmm. because none of those populations had put up a facility there. Mm -hmm. So we were attempting to solve that problem. Okay. So our location had everything to do with the population we are targeting. Okay. And since then, a lot of other providers have followed us into the east. Okay. You know, the, MP, the, the Mata Hospital came, AR is there, uh, the other healthcare facilities that have come up. But before then, there was really no significant private uh, healthcare provider in eastern Nairobi. Even public, mm -hmm. Mamalusi was built after we started. It's newer than Metropolitan. There was really no healthcare facility with its name in eastern Nairobi before us. People had to cross over to go to Kenyatta. They had to cross over to go and have a baby in Pumwani. They had to cross over to Aga Khan or Nairobi if they could afford those private facilities. So there was a lacuna. There you was take. a gap. Wow. Wow. And that's a gap we sought to fill. Mm -hmm. And that's a gap we are still working to fill by building a, what we call a healthcare hub. Okay. Which is a hospital with all the ancillary and supportive infrastructure that it needs. The doctors, the equipment, the staff, because a, a healthcare facility is more than infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have the infrastructure but no doctors, the infrastructure by, but no nurses, mm -hmm. then you do not have a facility. And you may have seen with the, the equipment program for the public facilities mm -hmm. that in certain places, uh, the, the equipment was bought. That's usually the easier thing, yes. expensive as it, is, as it is. The equipment was bought, but the people were not available. So ICUs could not be set up because the, the nurses with the training were not available and the doctors were not available. So our, our intention and our plan in Eastlands was not only to put up the hospital, but to attract healthcare talent okay. to work and live there. Mm -hmm. So along the way, we actually built a 34-bed estate called Metro Villas Estate, mm -hmm. which has houses as good as uh, Kilimani townhouses just next to the hospital, actually connected by a door like that one. Oh. Yes. So it's, it's a holistic approach. It's an ecosystem. Wow. Yes. And uh, that, that brings me to the issue of investing in healthcare. Yes. yes. Because you've been very intentional. You're saying you're, you know, an ecosystem. You're creating an ecosystem. Right. Kenyan healthcare. Yes. Has there been an, a deliberate effort to invest? Because you are doing your bit, but on a larger scale as a practitioner in the industry. Uh, has there been the channeling and pumping of money to make sure that you know the system itself is set to cater for the whole country in a better way? It's better now. Mm -hmm. It was a lot worse in the past. You see, at independence, Kenya did do a session of paper in 1965 and said we'll sort out education, we'll sort out healthcare, you know, disease, ignorance, and poverty. That was always the national objective, and it continues to be the national objective. The challenge is in the details and the how. So the government 
supported faith-based facilities with staff because they're the ones that were already spread out across the country. Mm -hmm. The government also provided teachers to schools that were originally started by missionaries. You know, whether it's Maseno or Mangu High School where I studied or Chogoria, mm -hmm. uh, the, usually you'd have a church, a school, and a healthcare facility mm -hmm. or alliance in Kikuyu. Mm -hmm. So the first step was uh, to expand reach, was to support the schools and support the faith-based hospitals. But that could only take us so far because it still depended on government resources and it, dependent, it, depend, it depended on missionaries mm -hmm. to continue to set up additional infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So with the dependence came uh, responsibility. The, 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 the missionaries were no longer evangelizing as much, mm -hmm. so building additional healthcare infrastructure sort of stalled. So if you look at many faith-based hospitals, mm -hmm. they date back to the early 1900s, yes. some are 100 years old. Mm -hmm. There are not too many that were being set up uh, after 1980. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the government faced challenges in the 1980s especially, so it had no money to invest in healthcare. So the gap now became bigger. We have a growing population mm -hmm. because if there is one thing we do yeah. fairly quite well, mm -hmm. it is getting the next generation of Kenyans. Yes. And uh, these young people need maternity places to be born. They need health care. So we were basically increasing our population at a faster rate than we could provide social services. Mm -hmm. So we needed a new player in the space. Mm -hmm. And that new player was going to be a private for-profit, an investor who was going to find the resources to put in health care and be able to earn a, a return. Mm -hmm. And that took some time. We are among the pioneers. Mm -hmm. But since us, you know, the Nairobi women followed about six years after us. Mm -hmm. And there are now quite a number of private for profit yes. healthcare facilities that have been put up by investors. We now are even attracting private equity into the healthcare space. Okay. You know, there are many more investors who uh, are putting up healthcare facilities. AR is now building a hospital. But for quite some time, yes. there was a big challenge because the capital was not available when you're setting up. Banks were not lending to healthcare because we are considered to be social enterprises. Mm -hmm. Social investing and impact investing were not what they are now globally. Yes. So there basically was no money available to fund ideas like ours. I was fortunate because having worked in the stock exchange, I was familiar with the fundraising yes. from the public. Mm -hmm. uh, so I knew that companies can do an IPO, um, companies can raise funds from members of the public, which is what we did. Mm -hmm. But because we could not seek a listing, because yes. there, no, there was no Ibuka then, mm -hmm. there was no startup listing then, the, the rules were very stringent for a listing. Yes. So we did a private placement. We got angel investors, you know, friends, in-laws. My in-laws invested their money. Mm -hmm. uh, my friends invested their money. My colleagues invested their money. And we had this angel investor from the UK mm -hmm. who put up 50% of the money we needed to start, mm -hmm. uh, of the 35 million shillings we needed to start off with then. Wow. So today, mm -hmm. I can say it's much better Yes than it was then, but we still have a lot of space to cover yes. for lost time. Fortunately, mm -hmm. we are improving healthcare financing because ultimately the key determinant is can people afford to pay for healthcare? Because healthcare generally is expensive the world over. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is that a lot of the inputs are imported. We don't make most of the medicines here. Mm -hmm. We certainly don't make a single ventilator here. We do not make dialysis machines here. So they're imported, they're bought in Forex, they're not cheap, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. A single ventilator, a good quality ventilator is something in the region of six, uh, of two to six million bob. One ICU ventilator for one patient. And an ICU patient needs one nurse. The ratio of staff to to patients is one to one. You need a personal nurse 24-7. Mm -hmm. Now that can't be cheap. 
So countries solve that problem by getting everybody to contribute while they are still healthy. Mm -hmm. So that the few members of the population who are sick at any given time can use the money from the entire population to access healthcare. Okay. That means universal health coverage. Mm -hmm. This is a time we are engaging uh, a lot more seriously in that agenda. Yes. I served on the Economic Council for six years during uh, President Kibaki's time. Mm -hmm. And at that time, healthcare was a footnote in the NESC agenda. Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. It was something we discussed after other serious economic business. Yes. Yeah? To the credit of the government, uh, there was recognition that uh, we needed to raise healthcare from a footnote to be among the key agendas, you know, to be as important as security, to be as important as economic growth. So I'm, I'm very pleased today when I see that when we talk about the four big agendas for the country, yes. healthcare is right there among them. Because it's only if we are all contributing yes. that those who are sick can afford healthcare because they don't have to pay while they're sick. That's because one of the worst tragedies to befall a family, and it be it bankrupts quite a lot of people here in the US, wherever, mm -hmm. is that you are sick, so you can't work, mm -hmm. and you have high bills to pay, mm -hmm. so you have a triple, you have a double challenge. You can't work, and you need to spend a lot to get well. Yeah. So the only way to solve that is all of us contribute. Mm -hmm. Whether it's through, through NHIF or multiple schemes, like our, our country where you have NHF and private insurance. But the important thing is that we need a mandate, like the one Obama was trying to create in the US, where everybody makes a contribution. Yes. Then we can pay for health care for those who become sick. Definitely. And now it won't matter whether you go to a public facility or a private facility. You'll choose the facility to go to, and your money will follow you to that facility. Okay. That's one key pillar mm -hmm. uh, that everybody needs to have money to pay. Okay. But of course, we also have to use the money well. So it is very important that healthcare be made as cost effective as it can be. Okay. That we leverage technology, that we shift tasks, you know, because the more qualified somebody is, the more expensive their time is. Mm -hmm. So we start shift so that uh, jobs, you know, uh, vaccination is not done by people who spend five years in school because that's going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to the extent that we can shift tasks to lower cadres of staff who can safely do it, we can shift tasks from human beings to technology, so that of the money that will be available, because money is never enough, mm -hmm. of the money that is available, we can then use it as effectively as possible. Definitely. That's a challenge we have for healthcare, mm -hmm. and we've been trying to do our bit on the fundraising side. Yes. And in being uh, a fast in many ways mm -hmm. in using technology. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the hospital we founded is among the the few that are paperless in their patient. We mm -hmm. have we don't use paper. Uh, we are the only hospital, as far as I know, that has a digital menu. We do not have forms for patients to fill for mm -hmm. meals. Mm -hmm. Food is ordered straight on tablets and it queues in the kitchen wow. and is labeled like prescription medicine. Oh, right. Why? Because to do a paper menu, mm -hmm. you know, get people to order on paper, then you need an analyst in the kitchen to work out how much ugali and how much sukuma wiki, and then you need to plan <laughs> the plates. Much. Something as simple as serving food mm -hmm. is, can be extremely complex in a hospital setting because of special diets and so on. Mm -hmm. So we are the only hospital, as far as I know, where the people who take your meal orders well, uh, digital utilization. take the order on a tablet mm -hmm. and bring you a meal with a barcode. Wow, that's, that's interesting because uh, actually our, t our time is really running. So. And uh, the issue of utilization of technology, you've touched on it, yes. quite important. Uh, you've been there yes. for 25 years. Uh, even the company itself has evolved, and now you are, you are targeting, you know, investing in healthcare system. That yes. is your big agenda. Yes. Um, why Ibuka now, briefly? And uh, what yes. are the projections? First, we promised our shareholders 25 years ago that one day, 
would list their company on a stock exchange. So we want to take that step and keep a promise. Because we, these 500 people who bought shares in the company have trouble when they want to exit. We have to try and find a buyer for, for the shares. Mm -hmm. That's something the stock exchange does, that does more efficiently than anyone else. It creates a market. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Two is that uh, we, a 25-year-old is just about beginning their career. You know? uh, and so in many ways, uh, the hospital has been growing roots the company has been growing roots. This is a time to really expand. And to do so, you need a partner. Because uh, to raise more capital, to, to take the model to other towns and places. So that's why we are coming on board mm -hmm. to create a market, uh, to find a fair value for the shares, to give our shareholders who may wish to exit a chance to do so, and to to provide leadership both in terms of ideas that you can raise money, mm -hmm. you can bring more money into healthcare through a stock market, mm -hmm. through raising money from the public, and in terms of being a platform that can show people how it can be done. Because okay. there are many things you've done and we are fast, the first to do it, mm -hmm. but when you're sitting in Islands, the country may never get to know. Mm -hmm. And good ideas that don't go beyond one person have no impact. Mm -hmm. So we want to have impact and a partnership with the exchange gives us a, a much better chance of having impact in terms of thought leadership and uh, financial modeling mm -hmm. than would otherwise ever do if we go it alone. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, amidst a pandemic, as we close up, we've yeah. seen even in the global arena, yes. uh, the Pfizer's coming up with vaccine, right. impacting the market hugely. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for you coming into you know, uh, the stock market and hoping to be listed as soon as possible, uh, your projections into the future in terms of, of your company uh, performance and the overall uh, health financing sector? The first thing I want to say is uh, post-COVID, everything will be different. Mm -hmm. Everything for everyone. And in healthcare, there will be transformation. The first is that there will be a lot more focus on public health. Because if there's something COVID has shown people, is that in many instances, all you have are public health interventions. Mm -hmm. Before curative medicine catches up with cures, the front line is public health. Mm -hmm. So we are looking into the public health space, immunization, wellness, what we can do to keep people healthy and out of hospitals. Okay. The second is uh, that technology will play a much bigger role. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to be in that space because we are familiar and uh, familiar with technology, we've embraced it, we are leveraging it. Mm -hmm. uh, the third is that the world is focusing a lot more on healthcare. And uh, by, making, by taking a central role, we can help other people like us who have ideas and don't have capital mm -hmm. to fund those ideas and uh, implement their ideas. Because had we had money earlier, we'd probably have grown faster than we did. Mm -hmm. So by coming on the stock exchange, we'll, we'll hopefully provide another first that if you have your idea, you want to set up a company that is in healthcare, that this is an option mm -hmm. that would be available to match ideas with resources for growth. Definitely. Yeah. And I uh, wish you all the best Thank in you. your Ibuka journey and uh, finally the listing bit of it. Asante sana. So, so, so there we have it. Very rich history. Understanding where we are coming from, where we are, and the future. And as Dr. Arias told us, post-COVID, things will not be the same. Actually, COVID has changed a lot healthcare financing included. And this will be the first company to be listed, hopefully, on the Nairobi Securities Exchange in the healthcare sector, healthcare financing, which is huge. And COVID has revealed that lacuna, that gap that is there that we need to fill and improve on as a country. Well, that's it. This is the trading bell. Thank you very much for engaging us. This does not stop here. We continue our engagement on social media. If you have any questions, speak to us and we will respond to you in time. That's it. I'm Noah Kipkimboy. Have yourself a good time.